what I did is I tried to highlight the area, the most important areas um, for this lecture. Um, they gave me another lecture this year in neuromuscular disorders and uh, chronic neurologic disorders in children, which is great because that may be a big part of what you'll see. And hopefully we'll be setting something up across the street so you can get some experience with, uh, with those type of patients. This doesn't work. <laughs> okay. So what I'm going to uh, do is here today is some definitions and look at the patterns of childhood death in the, in the country. Um, talk about children who need palliative care and some dying trajectories review some of the principles for pain and symptom management, and then go through some psychological and spiritual issues. Um, <clears throat> the necessary skill set to do pediatric palliative care includes assessment of symptoms in young and nonverbal or the cognitively impaired child, which isn't that easy. Um, and we need to have experience with the spectrum of pain management techniques and symptom control, knowledge of pediatric disease states, awareness of a child's understanding of the illness and of death, communication skills of talking to seriously children and their families, and obviously a commitment to an interdisciplinary approach to this. Um, so which children need palliative care? Well, patients with life-threatening conditions for which curative treatment is feasible but may fail, such as cancer, uh, conditions with prolonged treatments which promote good quality of life, but premature death is anticipated, for example, in HIV, cystic fibrosis, those types of illnesses. Uh, progressive conditions in which treatment is palliatively, palliative from the start, but may extend many years. For example, some inborn errors of metabolism, like mucopolysaccharidoses. Um, and finally, conditions of severe disability in which premature death is anticipated as in some of the neuromuscular disorders uh, and cerebral palsy, uh, that sort of thing that we see. Um, if we look at the models of pediatric palliative care, uh, treatments designed to cure or prolong life and those aimed at comfort are not mutually exclusive. And they, they show you this diagram in, with respect to adult palliative care as well, that the earlier model was active aggressive intent followed by palliative intent, then death and bereavement. Whereas if you look at it, um, diagram B, uh, you can see that as active aggressive intent it, it gets smaller, the palliative intent increases. Um, and finally, so it's, uh, again, we can really do both. Um, and hopefully, uh, when the law is passed, that children can have concurrent treatment uh, and be on hospice, meaning they can get their radiation treatment paid for um, by their insurance, by uh, Medicaid, uh, and at the same time uh, reap the benefits of being on a hospice program. Uh, that will become more uh, apparent. Um, situations where withholding or withdrawing treatment can be considered um, in the transition to palliative care with a pediatric patient are some of the following. The brain dead child, uh, kids in a permanent vegetative state, um, situations where there's no chance for survival, that is, we're doing very aggressive uh, care, but it's all it will do will prolong um, possibly suffering until the patient dies anyway. Uh, no purpose uh, situations, and that is even uh, with very aggressive treatment, there'll be such disability uh, uh, as a result of it that it, it almost seems as if there's no purpose to doing it. Um, if the impairment, uh, and that is the impairment due to treatment is too burdensome. Uh, the unbearable situation where further treatment can't be borne in the face of progressive illness, it's just too burdensome to continue to treat the child. And at that point we may say we're going to transition uh, to palliative mode. Um, Paul gave us a great uh, review of brain death recently, so just to talk a little bit about some of the differences with pediatrics, and you can comment if uh, uh, please. Uh, the most common causes of brain death in children are trauma and anoxic encephalopathy. Other causes include infections and uh, CNS malignancies. Um, criteria for brain death, um, the prerequisites of which are clinical or neuroimaging evidence of a, some sort of CNS catastrophe. 
uh, the exclusion of complicating medical conditions, severe acidosis, uh, severe electrolyte imbalances. Um, no drug intoxication or poisoning, which can confound the diagnosis. A core temperature greater than 36 degrees. And s normal systolic blood pressure, uh, either 100 mill millimeters mercury or what's appropriate for the age of the child. All right, remember normal yeah. systolic blood I think pressure. That the only difference between, uh, one of the difference between adult and children, because they have different set of uh, parameters for different age. Well, a good rule of thumb, if you ever, what's normal systolic blood pressure in a child? It's very easy, two times age in years, right? Okay. Uh, 70 plus two times age in years. All right, so for a 10-year-old, a normal systolic blood pressure is 90. Mm -hmm. Okay, so if you're ever in that situation, 70 plus two times age of years. Okay, so and the, what do you see on the neurologic exam in, in patient who's brain death? Uh, coma, absent motor responses, uh, pupillary light reflex is absent with mid-position dilated pupils, four to nine millimeters. No corneal reflexes, no ocular vestibular reflexes, that's the caloric response, yeah. eyes to ice, right? Uh, absent jaw and gag reflex, no, no coughing with suctioning, uh, in a baby, no sucking or rooting reflex. Do you know what a rooting reflex is? When you um, kind of stimulate the side of the mouth, the head turns uh, um, to uh, the source of the food. Okay. And then apnea demonstrated by an apnea test. Um, ancillary testing could be EEGs, evoked potentials, and studies of brain flow. Um, <coughs> there's an argument out there that brain death, yeah. Yeah, we're going to do that right now. Uh, and Paul just reviewed uh, adult brain death really for us, so you can sort of comment a little bit on the differences. Um, there's an argument out there that you really can't make a diagnosis of brain death in anybody less than seven, seven days of age. Okay. And there's argument back and forth about that. Um, in the age group, um, I'm sorry, this slide didn't get corrected for some reason. I corrected these slides last night. I'm so glad I did because none of it came out on this. Um, just ignore that second line. I in the age group from two months to a year, um, what's recommended is serial examination separated by 24 hours and one confirmatory ancillary test, uh, caloric test, whatever. Uh, in fact, the, um, what's preferred is the, um, to the oculovestibular reflex is the doll's eyes maneuver. Uh, in that age group. And then from 1 to 18 years, serial examination separated by 12 hours. Okay. Um, now remember, emotionally, even though legally withholding is the same as withdrawing, emotionally it's much more difficult to withdraw treatment than withhold. Okay. Uh, you know, the idea of taking uh, a loved one off uh, ventilatory support is very emotional. Um, so again, in the no-chance situation, life-sustaining treatment delays death and doesn't significantly alleviate suffering, such as the comatose patient who's on a ventilator, <coughs> okay? No purpose, the, the child may survive, but physical or mental impairment is so great that it's unreasonable to expect him to bear it. And, and the unbearable situation is, is in the face of progressive and irreversible illness, further treatment is more than anyone the child or the family can tolerate look a little bit uh, about how children die in the United States. Uh, we'll look at infant, fetal, and perinatal deaths, mortality for children, the differences in child mortality at different ages, and where children actually die in America. The one thing about childhood death is that compared to a hundred years ago, it's no longer expected. Okay. The, um, you know, the incidence of childhood death um, in 1915 was about 30 percent. Uh, you know, 100 children in 1,000 could be expected not to survive through uh, childhood, whereas in 1999 it's dropped, dropped significantly, most because of antibiotics and other things, and we'll see. Because in 1900, the leading causes of childhood death were pneumonia, influenza, TB, enteritis, and diarrhea, and with better supportive care and antibiotics, we, we sort of wiped that out. Right, immunizations, exactly. Um, so you can see there the um, pediatric deaths, um, 1999, 
uh, compared to the adults more than 65 is, is really relatively insignificant. Um, this is a, a little slide about the causes of pediatric mortality. Um, and you can see the black uh, pie slice there as injuries and accidental death, which comprises about 22 percent. Um, followed by homicide, uh, suicide, uh, that's about 5 percent. Um, and that kind of light slice uh, to the left there that represents about 12 percent is congenital anomalies. Okay. Um, and so you can take a look at that. Other causes are short, uh, short gestation, prematurity, extreme prematurity, uh, respiratory distress, um, complications of pregnancies. And if you look at that yellow slice uh, just at 12 o'clock, around 12, 11, 12 o'clock there, you can see sudden infant death syndrome. So even though that we've made a lot of progress in preventing that, it, it still exists. Um, so again, um, I I did try to fix these slides last night, but because of this, it doesn't uh, correct it. <laughs> um, uh, column one is the rank, uh, number one, two, and three causes of death. First column is infant. Now, infant's defined as somebody less than a year old, okay? So the most common number one cause of infant death is congenital anomalies, right? Followed by low birth weight, um, prematurity, sudden infant death, complications of pregnancy, and respiratory distress syndrome, which often follows from short gestation. In the one to four year old, as well as the five to 14 year old age bracket, accidents are the leading cause of death. Again, uh, one to four, you have congenital anomaly second, neoplasms, homicide, and heart disease. Whereas the five to 14, you start to see more incidence of malignant neoplasms as number two, and finally, homicide. Um, so, how many kids in the United States could benefit from, pediat from palliative care? Um, there's an increased survival of infants and children with congenital anomalies, prematurity, after accidents because of enhanced supportive care. And so there's a whole group of children that will be palliative care uh, eligible, uh, children with special health care needs. Uh, in 2001, it uh, uh, was looked at complex chronic conditions. And um, per year, um, it was found that more than 15,000 pediatric deaths uh, in 1997 uh, rendered 5,000 patients per day hospice eligible. Um, the, um, uh, the, I'm trying to remember what CHIPS means, something for pediatric palli palliative services estimates that about 8,600 children per day would benefit from palli palliative care services in the U.S. Um, just to, before we go forward, a little bit of a review of definitions of what's a neonate, what's a child, what's an infant. Full-term infant is 37 weeks. Okay, that's the normal um, uh, gestational period for pregnancy. A premature or preterm infant is somebody who's less than 37 weeks. An infant is somebody less than a year of age. And in, um, in terms of birth weight, we talk about Low birth weight, very low birth weight, and extremely low birth weight, okay? Uh, anybody less than 2,500 grams is low birth weight, or is extremely low birth weight are infants less than 1,000 grams. And, um, you know, at 24 weeks gestation, average birth weight is about five th 500 grams, just to give you uh, The neonatal period is the first month of life, and anything after that is post-neonatal. So if we look at the, the causes of um, mortality in infancy, that is patients less than a year of age, um, if you look in the middle box, the, ne the neonatal period, um, the number one cause is low birth weight and prematurity, okay? followed by congenital anomalies, complications of pregnancy, respiratory distress syndrome, and placenta and membrane complications. Um, after a month of age, uh, the top cause is still sudden infant death syndrome uh, with congenital anomalies, accidents, pneumonia, uh, and influenza, and finally homicide. Let's talk a little bit about congenital anomalies. Um, it can define it as a structural defect present at birth. It can be inherited, it can be sporadic. Uh, detection methods include exam, lab, radiographic uh, findings, 
fetal environmental causes include drug infections, um, this you know s uh, maternal nutritional deficiency or inju injury, uh, and we'll talk a little bit about drugs later. Um, and we have something called torches uh, rule out when we have somebody with defects with toxoplasma, rubella, um, a number of viral syndromes that can give rise to congenital anomalies. Um, about one in a hundred newborns may have some sort of chromosomal or genetic uh, mutation, although most of those aren't lethal, you know, they're, they're, or may even go unnoticed. A one in 200 have an inherited metabolic disorder or a sex chromosome anomaly. Again, most anomalies are not lethal. The serious malformations involve the heart, the brain, and the vital organs, and we'll talk a little bit about that. And the fatal inherited disorders often uh, involve neuromuscular, such as Burdick Hoffman, or, or metabolic dysfunctions, and, such as the inborn errors of metabolism that we see. Um, congenital heart disease, we'll talk about that because um, if there were to be a board question on pediatric palliative, it would probably involve congenital heart disease. So, the major cause of death in children with congenital malformations uh, involve malformations of the heart. Um, it can occur between 0.5 to 0.8 percent of live births, involve 10 to 25 percent of fetal deaths, uh, miscarriages, um, and 2 percent of premature infant deaths. Uh, improved outcomes are due to advanced surgical procedures, uh, sometimes even um, prenatal um, uh, surgical procedures, uh, in utero surgical procedures for some of these. Survival is still limited in those with uncorrectable lesions or coexisting malformations. So, cyanotic congenital heart disease are the most serious. Um, there's, it, it, think about the T's, okay? Um, if it's, there's a question about cyanotic congenital heart disease, just think about the T. The most common being the tetralogy of fellow. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit about what truncus arteriosus, tricuspid, transposition of the great vessels, and total anomalous pulmonary venous return. And there's tons of other <laughs> conditions, <laughs> finally. But, uh, you know, if you, had to, if you had to remember one thing, I'd remember tetralogy, okay? Because that can, can happen in up to 4 or 5% of these cardiac malformations. Okay, so this is a little review of what tetralogy is. I believe this was described back in the 1800s on a series of patients who all had similar findings. Um, what happens is uh, if you look at the aorta, okay, it overrides a ventricular septal defect. So what happens is you get purple blood going in, there's mixed blood going in there. Um, there's some pulmonic stenosis, there's usually a VSD, there's an overriding aorta. So what happens is you get a cyanotic um, uh, defect. Okay, so typically uh, a child with tetralogy uh, has these episodes when they valsalva, when they cry, um, Okay, they get um, bluish skin and, and cyanotic episodes, um, particularly when they're upset. Um, truncus arteriosus, um, here you can see on the, the left is a normal heart. On the right you have this big common trunk arising, again, usually over a ventricular septal defect. Okay, so um, if you think about the embryology of it, where these things normally differentiate, uh, there's a defect there. And so what you have is one, one big trunk arising to the systemic circulation with mixed blood in it. Um, tricuspid atresia, um, there you have a normal heart on the left there. Uh, there's no valve, there's no um, right ventricle there on the right. and. Um, and so what happens is, uh, uh, again, you usually have an atrial septal defect um, that can give you some mixing of the blood. Um, and total anomalous pulmonary venous uh, return or connection, TAPVR, I see quite a lot of these uh, in my residency. Um, the pulmonary veins, uh, when in the embryology, normally differentiate and collect to the left atrium, right? So they bring oxygenated blood back to the, the left atrium, left ventricle, and out to the systemic circulation. And uh, here they don't do that. Uh, and um, so what you have is, um, you know, mixing of the blood. You, um, all four pulmonary veins connect to the superior vena cava, okay? So you have oxygenated blood from the lungs 
going into the superior vena cava and the right side of the heart. Okay. Uh, so um, anyway, that's the, um, the, this is correctable. Again, a lot of these very serious uh, correctable lesions involve several procedures um, and still may result in quite a lot of disability. Um, the other one I should add, I'm going to add this slide, is something called hypoplastic left heart, okay? which if you look at the uh, anatomy of the heart there, it's a defect where the, the left ventricle is basically non-existent. Okay? And the right ventricle serves as the systemic ventricle until the ductus arteriosus closes. You know the ductus arteriosus connects the pulmonary um, artery with the aorta, right? It's a little... And um, I ha actually had a case of this this year. Um, and what happens is life is sustained as long as the ductus is open. Um, and once the ductus closes, um, there's no connection of oxygenated blood to the systemic circulation. Uh, and I had a case this year of um, a couple from Uzbekistan who um, came here when she was 28 weeks pregnant and discovered that this was the defect. Years ago, we kind of used to put these babies in the nursery and the ductus closes generally at 72 hours and they would, they would die very shortly afterward. Uh, now they'll actually do some prenatal manipulation. Um, however, this couple uh, came in a little late and um, discovered it late. Uh, so being uh, very sensible people, they uh, had one five-year-old normal uh, child. They uh, were offered comfort care as an option to three surgical procedures and probably a very, very difficult life uh, for this child. And they opted to just do comfort care. And the problem with this patient is she had a very large ductus. So they took the baby home, expecting that she would die within a week. And this patient survived for three weeks. So if you can imagine, you know, all the bonding that goes on and the baby looked very normal for at least two and a half of those three weeks. And I went to see her uh, one day and she actually started to look cyanotic and I heard a murmur, which wasn't there before, which means the ductus was closing. Uh, and she died within 24 hours when that happened. But um, those cases can get referred to hospice uh, when the family opts for comfort care. This is my personal favorite. This is where the um, aorta comes out of the right ventricle <laughs> and the um, pulmonary um, artery comes out of the left ventricle. And what they do is a Norwood one called a switch operation, where they actually just switch the great vessels. Okay, and this is another cyanotic. So what you have is two serial circulations. So the blood's coming in the right ventricle, going to the right, coming in to, to the right ventricle, and going out to the circul to the um, systemic circulation. And then you have the um, left ventricle pumping oxygenated blood to the to the lungs which is coming back oxygenated to the left atria and going out again so you know they're in series but the oxygenated blood isn't getting to the periphery where it needs to be um, congenital disorders of the nervous system probably the one that concerns us most is neural tube defects um, anencephaly is the um, the worst form of neural tube defect you'll see where there's absence of all or a major part of the brain Spina bifida, uh, in severe cases, the overall mortality is 10 to 15 percent. Um, and for the very severe cases, most deaths occur before four years of age. Um, the extent of paralysis uh, or mental retardation depends on the location and the extent of the defect. And these are children that have chronic care needs. They're generally um, uh, quadruparetic, paraparetic, um, with neurogenic bladders, that, uh, with, you know, uh, propensity to aspiration, uh, may have some degree of mental retardation as well, but not all, not all. Um, so both anencephaly and spina bifida occur in one in a thousand uh, live births. Yeah. So just to review uh, the development of the neural tube, remember this is uh, from embryology way back when. You have a neural plate that differentiates from the neural fold, it evaginates in, you get neural crest, uh, and then finally differentiates into the outer layer of the ectoderm and the neural tube, which forms the spinal cord. Okay, and this is a view from above. 
Okay, so you have this thing in the embryo, and it, uh, and this happens between 25 to 28 days of gestation. This happens very, very early in pregnancy before a woman may even know that she's pregnant. Okay, so this is, we used to get a few of these a year um, from the delivery room. Um, and most of these patients are born gasping and die within 24 hours of birth uh, when it's severe. Uh, this is spina bifida accompanied by a meningocele. Okay, we actually have an evagination of the spinal contents. Um, and there's, there's varying degrees to, depending what's in that, um, that cyst that comes out of the back. Uh, this usually gets corrected. Uh, but there may be uh, damage to the cord um, that's not correctable. Um, so what causes neural tube defects? Well, there are genetic factors. Um, in monozygotic twins, uh, there's a high concordance rate. Um, um, one thing we identified a couple of years ago is folic acid deficiency in very early pregnancy, which is why most obstetricians put everyone who's newly pregnant on folate supplements. Um, if a patient is taking, a, a mother is taking folate antagonists, uh, of which a lot of the anticonvulsants uh, are folate antagonists, it can uh, give rise to that. And then there are metabolic disorders that are associated with it. Uh, what are the folic acid inhibitors? Well, you can see there are a lot of um, anticonvulsants. Uh, tegretol, uh, phenobarbital, dilantin. Uh, Trimethoprin, of course, is an antibiotic, which isn't uncommon in the treatment of urinary tract infections. Mm -hmm. So if you happen to be unlucky and have a urinary tract infection, theoretically, you could uh, have a problem with uh, folic acid inhibition. Let's talk a little bit about low birth weight and prematurity. Um, still the leading cause of neonatal mortality and handicaps, subsequently, as our neonatologists uh, um, our neonatal skills become more advanced. Um, there are more and more infants surviving this. And um, again, this forms a large portion of children with special needs. Most very low birth weight infants are premature rather than SGA, which is small for gestational age. Okay. So you can have a baby born at 37 weeks who weighs four pounds. Uh, that's small for gestational age. Um, but again, um, most uh, very low birth weight infants are premature. Um, so if you're born at uh, 500 to 600 grams, the survival rate is 20%. Um, whereas if you're born at 1250 to 1500 grams, the survival rate is, goes up to 85, 90%. Very few born at 22 weeks survive. And uh, those who are born at 30 weeks have a 90, greater than 95% survival rate. The mortality from prematurity results from conditions associated with immature organs. Respiratory distress syndrome, RDS, is immature lungs. Intraventricular hemorrhage comes from immature cerebral blood vessels. Um, necrotizing enterocolitis comes from an immature GI tract. Um, and finally, infections, pneumonia, can come from a, an underdeveloped immune system. Um, sudden infant death, I want to talk about a little. Um, I'd practice pediatrics in the days before the back to sleep campaign was uh, initiated, um, which is you put the baby on his back to go to sleep. Um, and it's the most common cause of death in infants less than a year of age. It's a diagnosis of exclusion. Generally, the patient presents usually to an emergency room at two to four months of age. Um, uh, it's a totally normal baby. These are not dysmorphic looking babies. and. The usual story is the mother went to check on them at 6 or 7 o'clock in the morning and they weren't breathing. 90% okay. um, of this occurs in infants less than 6 months of age. The risk factors we find out in involve sleep position, which is when the back to sleep campaign, that is you put the baby on the back or the side to go to sleep, not on the stomach. Now this came out after my son was in this period and I'm glad because he would never go to sleep any other way but on his stomach. So. Um, the other things that have been associated with is very soft bedding and cigarette smoke in the house. Uh, one to five percent of deaths diagnosed initially as SIDS uh, turn out to be abuse or suffocation. And the vast majority of unexplained, unexpected infant deaths uh, involve sudden infant death syndrome. Um, it really, the incidents really dropped down uh, after we uh, 
initiated, the American Academy of Pediatrics initiated this back to sleep campaign. It was, it was quite amazing, but um, it still exists, so. In children uh, one to five years, um, the cause of death in, can involve unintentional injuries, including uh, motor vehicle accidents. Uh, drowning in certain parts of the country is actually the number one um, cause of death. Fire and burns, airway obstruction injuries, swallowing a grape or a peanut, uh, and uh, pedestrian injuries. Uh, congenital anomalies uh, still play a role in this age group. Uh, malignant neoplasms we start to see in this age group. Um, which include leukemias, brain, ca uh, brain and CNS, uh, other CNS uh, malignancies, uh, compared to adults where the most common cause would be something like lung cancer, breast cancer, and prostate cancer. And finally, we start to see intentional injuries and child abuse in this age group. Uh, so where are children in the U.S. dying? <coughs> well, 56% of them die as hospital inpatients, 16% at outpatient sites, about 5% are dead on arrival at hospitals. Only 11% overall die at home. Um, and very, very few of them die in nursing homes, if you compare that to the adult data, right? Um, however, if you're a cancer patient, you have a, m a much greater chance of dying at home. So compared to overall incidence of 11%, 36% of cancer, pediatric cancer patients will die at home. Um, Children who die in their families are a very diverse group. Unintentional and intentional injuries make up an important contribution to death in childhood. An array of rare fatal disorders collectively generate a significant impact on childhood death rate. Uh, many important causes of death in childhood are linked to socioeconomic disparities. Hospitals do play an important part in the care of children who die uh, with uh, of complex conditions. And there's no single protocol for palliative care that fits the need of children and their families. It really needs to be uh, adjusted um, uh, on an individual basis. Um, one of these days I'm going to fix this slide. Um, so the dying trajectories for children are very similar to adults. Okay? You have the sudden unexpected death, such as an accident where everything's going along fine, uh, and then death occurs. The lethal congenital anomaly uh, basically, patients survive for a very short period of time. Um, potentially curable disease uh, may have um, peaks and troughs. Um, and the progressive condition, um, there's slow deterioration with uh, improvement, but not quite back to baseline uh, with acute episodes. Hmm. Uh, talk a little bit about symptom management. We're going to aim for comfort, optimize quality of living and dying, maintain the child's dignity, um, comprehensive assessment of all the patient's needs, and most importantly, believe the child's report of pain, symptoms, and suffering. We need a multi-dimensional assessment, incorporate pharmacologic and non-pharmacologic interventions, and be very proactive in avoiding delays of treatment. Um, we're going to keep it simple, keep it minimally invasive. And we need to consider the burden on the child and the family with whatever we do. Uh, we're going to treat common side effects aggressively, review the goals of care regularly, and communicate and coordinate with other health care professionals and provide 24-hour support for the family. This is one of the real problems with the palliative care service that I'm working with now is that whereas in hospice there's a 24-hour hotline, um, patients can call any time, it doesn't really exist um, for palliative care, which is really a, a consulting service, unless you have um, a very well-organized and well-funded palliative care service, home palliative care service. Um, it's very difficult to provide 24-hour uh, support. We do it in the hospital for our palliative care patients, but if you think about the palliative care home patient, um, uh, and that it's a real problem. Um, for our pediatric patients. Okay, and so this is an example of something they can hang on their refrigerator where they have all their specialists listed um, if there's a problem. So let's talk briefly about common symptoms in, in, in pediatric palliative care. Um, what you have to do um, before you go into assessing symptoms is know a little thing, a little bit about child development. 
Um, remember Piaget? You may remember that from a college psychology course. Uh, talks about pre-operational, concrete, and formal stages of thinking. So, um, you know, a two-year-old uh, is um, a, a very concrete. There's kind of psychotic-like thinking. Uh, finally, um, transitions to a concrete stage, and then there's more abstract thinking as the child gets older. Which um, so pre-operational thought. Uh, that's the early stages. Uh, it's more symbolic. Uh, it's egocentric, so kids can't uh, distinguish between their own perspective and someone else's. Um, they can't engage in operations. They can't reverse actions mentally. Um, and it's really intuitive rather than logical. Um, what you have to know is that um, I if you look at all age groups, a um, certain percentage of 10-year-olds are still in a pre-operational thought. Uh, so uh, again, just because a child is, is um, five or six doesn't mean that they necessarily have that kind of thought pattern. Okay. So what do we do when talking to children who are two to five? <coughs> we want to get very simple, concrete information, comfort, reassurance, and always have the family members present. Um, involve in, we involve the parents in care, the explanations, answer questions uh, calmly and with examples. Uh, and we use play therapy, puppets, dolls, and storytelling uh, for teaching expression of emotion. Um, in the older age group, they can become very preoccupied with the details and <laughs> ask the same question repeatedly. They actually may feel responsible for the illness and need some reassurance that it's not their fault. Um, family is still very important. It's a great age, 9 or 10. They're totally family oriented as opposed to later <laughs> years. Um, they still think concretely but benefit from more information about what's happening. And again, reading, playing, drawing, art therapy, and music um, therapy may be appropriate modalities of intervention for this age group. Um, when they get a little older, they become very aware of feeling different. They're going to go in chemotherapy and their hair falls out. Um, they may be stoic and brave. Uh, they may try to protect their parents, their caregivers. Uh, they benefit from a safe environment to explore their fears, their expectations, and hopes. They may benefit from meeting with other children or caregivers away from their parents. So this is an age where you can actually interview them, talk to them a little bit without the parents around. And again, we use reading, playing, drawing, music intervention. Peer-based support is important. Adolescents um, can be particularly difficult to engage. Um, they can, you can have a wide range of responses to facing critical and life-threatening illness from adolescents. They're caught between being independent and feeling the pull of dependence that can happen when they have a serious illness. Uh, so um, they have difficulty talking with non-ill peers because they feel different. Um, they do benefit from being matched with other adolescents uh, facing illness. They also benefit from activity-based groups that are not focused on illness. And again, creative outlets can be helpful with this age group. So that said, um, most of the data on pain in pediatric palliative care relates to cancer patients. Um, there's a high incidence of procedure and treatment related pain that still exists. The prevalence of pain and the need for regular analgesia remains significant and inadequate relief is still being documented in the literature. Um, pain in pediatric cancer can be disease related or treatment related. So we see bone pain in metastatic disease and in the leukemias, uh, somatic pain with osteosarcomas, rhabdomyosarcomas, visceral pain with uh, uh, liver cancer, and neuropathic pain with things like neuroblastoma and a Ewing sarcoma of the spine. Treatment-related re treatment um, pain includes pain from mucositis, extravasation, and neuropathies as a result of, uh, of chemotherapy radiation therapy, mucositis, and local tissue damage, same as we see in adults, uh, post-operative um, pain in, as in phantom limb when they amputate for a osteosarcoma, uh, immune-related uh, graft-versus-host disease, and finally post-operative pain uh, in patients who've required surgery. Um, in HIV disease, we know that there's a significant prevalence of pain. 
uh, up to 59% of outpatients and 88% of inpatients. Um, pain can be disease related as in pancreatitis, consequence of opportunistic infections like fungal enteritis. We see a lot of treatment related um, pain in our uh, clinic across the street. A lot of everybody has peripheral neuritis. Even if they don't know it, if you ask about it, you can usually get a history of it. And because it's a disease with multi-organ involvement, you can have pain at multiple sites. Um, <clears throat> and, and there's also an impact of the virus on developmental milestones in children, which complicates assessment of pain. Um, the typical signs of pain may attenuate with chronic pain or, or in the very ill child, so you need to have an individualized approach. There's a lot of formal pain measurement tools out there, which include self-report, behavioral uh, measurements, and biologic measurements. If patient's greater than three years and the cognition is intact, there are multiple options for assessing pain. What, when it becomes challenging is in the nonverbal, cognitively impaired, or very regressed child, where we have to rely on caretaker's description of behaviors that deviate from the usual or on uh, behavioral or biologic assessment tools. <clears throat> okay, so <clears throat> these are a uh, number of self-report tools. So we have the poker chip tool, where you can put as many poker chips as pain you have. Uh, you can see that uh, there. Okay, so how, many, how much pain do you have today? Um <clears throat> there's the faces scale we're all familiar with, visual analog in uh, kids more than five. Is it a five, mm -hmm. is it a 10? <clears throat> Outer scale, uh, which is actually photographs of distressed faces, uh, and a pain diary in older child and adolescent uh, is, is possible. So we know this is the Wam Baker facer tool, faces tool. We use this for adults in here in this hospital, right? Um, the poker chip tool. Um, and then there's behavioral measures. Uh, there's procedural rating scale where we look at 10 behaviors and score them, crying, screaming, uh, verbal resistance, uh, muscular rigidity, um, pain expressions, flailing. Uh, the Children's Hospital of Eastern Ontario has a, a scale of six observed behaviors and then 15 behaviors subdivided into three subscales. So um, these are behavioral. Uh, so children unable to self-report, we used a revised FLAC. Are you familiar with the FLAC uh, skull? I have a, uh, so this is a FLAC. Okay, we can use this in adults as well. Uh, so we look at the face, the legs, the activity, the cry, and the consolability. Um, uh, if you get a zero score, if your face has no particular expression or you're smiling, uh, if you're occasionally grimacing or withdrawn or disinterested, you get a one. And if you're frequently frowning, got a clenched jaw or a, a quivering chin, you get a score of two. All right. With the legs, they can be in normal position or relaxed, uh, uneasy, restless, or tense. And if the legs are kicking up and down, you get a, a, a score of two. And the activity uh, can range from lying quietly to arched, rigid, or jerking. Um, cry, uh, zero would be no cry. If the patient is moaning or whimpering, occasionally complaining, you get a score of one. If they're steadily crying, screaming, sobbing, or frequently complaining, you get a score of two. So um, you, you get the idea. Um, <clears throat> one of the things in infants is consolability. That is, you pick the baby up, and they continue to scream and cry no matter what you do. Uh, and then you would get a, uh, a score of two. Very difficult to console. Um, just come back there. So there's a number. And these, this just lists some of the various um, uh, tools that have been used for children unable to self-report. Okay, so um, a pharmacologic approach to pain, we, we use the WHO analgesic ladder, which I think was initially invented uh, for children. Uh, it's based on pain severity. Uh, we want to avoid NSAIDs and cancer and HIV disease. And agonist antagonist uh, a group of opioids we generally avoid with, um, with children. Um, meperidine we know is okay if you give one dose, if, you use, if it's going to be prolonged, we want to avoid that drug. Uh, for dose limiting toxicity, um, we use adjuvants to widen therapeutic window and reduce the dose or rotate the opioid. And that's a WHO analgesic ladder. You're familiar with this, right? Okay. <coughs> um, the doses are based on weight, 
and, and this is the part I think that non-pediatricians find most distressing about uh, doing pediatrics in general. Um, so the starting dose of PL morphine for a child, um, if it's patient less than 50 kilograms, um, uh, is 0.15 to 0.3 milligrams per kilogram every three to four hours, okay? Um, whereas the greater than 50 kilograms, it's sort of in the adult range. Um, the incomplete cost tolerance can be clinically relevant, so we're going to start the new opioid at a reduced dose from 30 to 50 percent of the equal analgesic dose. Um, I think um, one of the board questions was on the dose of morphine for a child, okay? So if you had to memorize one thing, it would be the dose of morphine, both PO and IV, um, for a child based on per kilo, okay? Because, or I think the way they asked it was, what's the appropriate dose of morphine for this size child, so. This is PIN, we're talking about PIN. Hmm? We're talking about PRN, PIN, as needed? Well, yeah, the initial, the initial starting dose in other words, uh, PO, and I think they also ask IV, which is a little easier. It's 0.1 milligram per kilo for uh, patients less than 50 kilos, okay? Um, the oral route, again, 0.15 to 0.3. So um, I, I, I think you need to know that. Um, the rest, they'll provide a, a table, you know. Remember that the half-life is prolonged in premature and full-term in infants, okay, of, uh, of morphine. Fentanyl, we know it's rapid onset, short duration of actions. It's very lipophilic with rapid IV administration. When it was first being used um, with any regularity, there were reports of chest wall rigidity, and I think about 19 deaths initially were reported back in the 90s. Um, it's bound to alpha-1 acid glycoproteins in plasma, which are reduced in the neonatal period. Okay. What happens then is that there's more free fentanyl, which is uh, uh, which can possibly uh, produce toxicity. Um, and we do use the transoral mucosal route for painful procedures in pediatrics. Um, in the studies that were done uh, for its use in lumbar puncture and uh, intrathecal um, chemotherapy administration, there was a high incidence of nausea vomiting, 25% uh, with the transoral mucosal route. Um, the other thing um, that you need to know is that there is a warning with fentanyl about its use in fever and um, so that um, the amount absorbed. I actually tried to search whether there are any studies on this. Do you know, Sammy? Mm -hmm. No. But um, on some of the drug information warnings, there is a warning about using a fentanyl transdermal in the situation of fever. Um, yeah. Case reports, right. I've certainly seen cases. We had one child. And the problem is children have fevers much more frequently than adults. Uh, and so, um, you know, we occasionally see a, a child uh, roll into the lobby uh, cyanotic um, with fever, and the only thing we can think of is fentanyl patch. Um, so um, it's, it's very interesting. I recently had a five-year-old who was up to 100 micrograms of fentanyl, yet the rescue dose she was using was five milligrams of oxycodone. So uh, I, I was very um, interested in what level, uh, what the blood level of fentanyl would be, because I know that she wasn't getting 100 micrograms of fentanyl. And um, she was very small, uh, not certainly cachectic, but, uh, you know. So I often wonder about, um <coughs> and the oncologists use uh, transdermal fentanyl very frequently in their pediatric uh, patients. So. And the other thing is that Medicaid won't pay for any more than 50 micrograms in a child. So we had a big problem uh, trying to get the 100 microgram patches for her. Okay, so we can use sustain release preparations in pediatric patients. Cadian is little sprinkles and can be put in applesauce, which is grainy. Uh, so that's one way to do it. Um, rectal use for opiates is not sustainable for more than a couple of doses. Uh, relative contraindications being neutropenia, thrombocytopenia. <coughs> we know that transdermal fentanyl um, can, can take tw 12 to 16 hours for a steady state to occur and has, can have a long clearance in children. 
and talked a little bit about the, the transmucosal root. Um, so parenteral root is most appropriate for acute severe pain crisis or near end of life, and we can do this at home. Uh, subcutaneous root is acceptable if the IV placement is very distressing or very difficult. Uh, we don't use IM roots if possible. Um, we, we rarely need to use epidural intrathecal roots um, uh, for localized pain uh, unrelieved by systemic analgesics, but we can use, um, we can do that. Um, <coughs> the breakthrough or rescue dose of the opiate you can use a formula of one-fifth of the sustained release preparation that's used every 12 hours or 10% of the 24-hour, 5 to 10% of the 24-hour opiate requirement uh, available on an hourly basis. Or for patients on an infusion, give 50 to 200% of the hourly basal rate available every one hour as a breakthrough dose. We want to prevent um, side effects aggressively, uh, bowel regimen, um, Miralax, Lactulose. We use mineral oil a lot for constipation in children. You can flavor it with chocolate syrup. It actually comes chocolate flavored. Um, the risks are the same as adults, that is aspiration, so you want to do that in an older child, you know, somebody over three or four. Um, and children are open to non-pharmacologic approaches. Uh, the developmental stage will influence the applicability to uh, non-pharmacologic approaches. And there are a lot of techniques that we use that don't have any controlled studies. So environmental modification, distraction techniques, uh, cognitive behavioral, uh, sensory physical modalities, and other techniques. Um, when on Thursday mornings, I used to do sedation for MRIs in um, children. And um, we had a thing going where we'd give them some oral Versed, uh, and which works r r rapidly. And we had a big book um, you know, for kids less than five, where we'd sit there and the nurse practitioner would kind of read the book or the parent would read the book and we'd put the arm out under the book um, <laughs> and uh, put the IV in with the Versed. We'd also put EMLA on uh, an hour before we'd have the parents apply the EMLA <coughs> to various sites before they came in. And uh, some of these kids didn't even know that an IV was being placed, so they were distracted. You know, we had some a little bit of anxiolysis going and some topical analgesia. And it made it very pleasant, uh, something that could otherwise be very unpleasant. Um, respiratory symptoms are present in about 40% of children dying from cancer. Uh, dyspnea, remember, is a subjective experience, has nothing to do with the PCO2 or anything else that you can measure. Um, in cystic fibrosis, it's a prominent feature in the last two years of life. Um, the potential therapy is directed at the cause. Uh, the treatment is very similar for adults, so that we use opiates, benzodiazepines, sedation fans, cool cloths, and positioning of the patient. Um, starting dose for dyspnea for an opiate-naive child is anywhere from 25 to 30 percent of the dose used for pain. You need less opiate for dyspnea than you do for pain. The recommendation of the American Academy of Thoracic Surgeons is 40 percent of the starting pain dose. Nausea and vomiting can mean multifactorial, um, uh, can relate it to the underlying disease, treatments, hepatic dysfunction, electrolyte abnormalities, you determine the cause to guide treatment. This is a great slide. This is one of my favorite slides from my fellowship. Um, it goes through all the pathways. Uh, we know that there's a chemoreceptor trigger zone, which is in the area postrema of the fourth ventricle. And our chemotherapy, our opioids and anesthetics are what um, um, stimulates this area to the vomiting center in the medulla, right? And if you take this art in red here are where the various um, modalities for treatment of nausea vomiting uh, act, okay? So the benzos, when we give our patient Ativan for nausea vomiting, it's acting on a higher cortical center. Okay, so you can just look at this. Dopamine antagonist like Haldol uh, will act um, between the chemoreceptor trivisome and the vomiting center. Uh, as well cannabinoids. Okay. Uh, I'm going to slip past. We don't, we're kind of out of time. We started a little bit late. Uh, and this goes through sleep disturbances um, and some of the um, treatments for that. Uh, other common symptoms, uh, bleeding, um, 
Remember, resuscitation life-sustaining measures are available even at the end of life. Um, we want to avoid undue parental responsibility for any decision regarding life-sustaining measures. Same as in adults, you know, we really want to <coughs> give some guidance as to prognosis and uh, not place the whole burden of whether to resuscitate on parents. Um, <coughs> Uh, sedation at the end of life, um, there's many concerns, misconceptions, and when you start to talk about palliative sedation at the end of life, you want to review previous approaches and adverse effects, proximity of death, the presence of concurrent symptoms, and every, under everyone's understanding of what the child's condition is. Um, so for emotional and psychological considerations, um, it's very difficult living with uncertainty. The emotional needs and coping methods differ among family members and at different times during the illness. Families need information, they need open and honest communication. And it's very important for the family to have choices and to retain control over what's going on. A spiritual care. <coughs> uh, spiritual concerns are important to children and young adults. They explore the purpose and the value of life. Uh, and, and many of us <laughs> can find these concerns difficult to address. Uh, we need a multidisciplinary approach for this. Um, so, in and to sum up, we design the care to fit the level of development, respect the family and the child. We want to be effective and compassionate throughout the spectrum of the illness, educate staff regarding the, the fatal medical condition, and individual and organizational changes to made to provide excellent care, whatever we need to do there. And finally, we need improved research to increase our understanding of pediatric palliative issues.